as, it, as we heard, I'm going to talk to you about the work that we carry on in the lab in uh, the Institute of Neurology, which is uh, the major institute in pretty much the UK for any very strange neurological condition. So if you have anything weird, we end up with bits of your brain. So, let's see if I get this right. So, my lab for some time actually um, has been looking at how microglia respond in neurodegenerative diseases and particularly, I don't know why I was drawn to it, but it's probably because nobody else was working on it at the time, but as you all know, there's been this big explosion of people interested in, in Alzheimer's disease. But I started looking at this quite a few years now um, ago because most of the work on microglia in the UK was on MS, multiple sclerosis. My um, collaborator, when I first moved at the Institute, was um, a woman who was working on MS. So there was a lot of immunology going on, and I kind of came in, but I really am not an immunologist, so don't please talk to me about B, B cells or T, or T cells, because I don't know anything about them. I'm more of a neuroscientist who's used what I know about the brain to work on microglia. So as uh, I said, we're interested in how these cells change in the brain in neurodegeneration, what prompts them to change, and whether we can modify these changes to, um, well, basically make them less toxic if they are toxic. And also at the moment, my lab's really um, focused on looking at translational assays. We've got a couple of companies that are funding us to look at how we can modify microglial responses for translational purposes. So um, we published this review. My postdoc, Tom Pierce, and I published this review. Now, obviously, I'm preaching to the converted with regard to what microglia do normally. Uh, but we wanted to look, as I say, about what they do. So this is a review looking at you know, how you can model this, how you can look at what microglia are doing. And so and initially, all my lab really has been looking at in vitro work. I mean, there's a lot of debate about whether that's relevant or not. But I, actually, I think... Now we've moved on to iPSCs, I actually do think it's very relevant, and I'll tell you why as we move on. But So we've always had an in vitro um, aim. Um, I've never really liked work working with animals, so I decided early on, yeah, I'm going to go and just kill them and get the brain out. But now we don't even do that. It's all human. Everything we do now is based on human cells. So just to introduce you to Alzheimer's disease, there are two main types. There's early onset AD, which is really remarkably only 20% of the population of people that are going to get Alzheimer's disease. And this is really quite well understood in terms of the genetic factors. So we have mutations, for example, in presenilin-1, we have amyloid precursor protein, and we have presenilin-2. But this, as I say, is only 20% of all the people that are going to get Alzheimer's disease. So what about the rest of us? You know, we're all going to get it possibly if we live long enough. I mean, you're going to get some, probably about a third of you are going to get AD. So risk factors, well, we know for quite some time that age, the longer you live, the more you're likely to get Alzheimer's disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, serum cholesterol levels. And this is linked with the APOE um, allele that's linked to also to late onset Alzheimer's disease. Now, APOE is a, a protein which binds cholesterol. It can also bind A, beta and shove it out of the brain. So it's not available to actually form plaques. So unfortunately, if you have, and you're Caucasian or you're Japanese or you're Islandic, well, Caucasian, Islandic, and you have the APOE epsilon four, then that's an indication that you're probably gonna get Alzheimer's disease. Interestingly, if you're African or American African, and you have APOE4, you're not necessarily going to get Alzheimer's disease. So it depends on your sort of genetic mix, which is interesting in itself. But what's actually been happening is that we're gradually realizing that late onset Alzheimer's disease is not just these factors. There's a genetic risk component to getting Alzheimer's disease. And we've been looking at this. So for example, we know that Alzheimer's disease has a very early inflammatory event, and microglia can become um, changed, they can become dystrophic, they look senescent, they can decrease or increase in numbers depending on where you look, and so they can change. So there's always been this interest, but these two papers here by Lambert et al. and Jones et al. were the first two papers with a genetic link to late onset Alzheimer's 
indicating that there might be an involvement of genetic risk factors. And then we went on to publish with John Hardy. He phoned me up one, one, one weekend and said, um, what does TREM2 do? And I was like, I have no idea. So I went rushing around for the weekend and looked up and said, well, you know, it's quite important. And then we published this paper back to back with a group called Johnson et al. in 2013, showing that there are risk factors associated with late onset Alzheimer's disease. And in this review, we talk about some of these. So for example, um, there's CR1 complement, um, CR, this CR1 complement with what we call an odds ratio of 1.21. So that increases your risk 1.2 times. And then this triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells, TREM2, which I've been working on now for the last few years which has an odds ratio of 2.9 to, uh, to 5. Now, what's interesting about that, the odds ratio, i.e. the chance of you getting Alzheimer's disease for um, these mutations in TREM2, is very similar to the... but we've also used the Potofsky method to get our cells looking more like um, mature microglia, and I'll explain how we do that in a minute. So basically, you find out a patient that's got uh, a mutation, and you take a small biopsy of the skin with a bit of um, the underlying. I mean, it's not particularly pleasant, but they, you just get the skin, and then you culture these fibroblasts, and you transform them with these classic um, transcription factors until you go back and you get the stem cells, which we have here. And then you culture them in a V-shaped, non-adherent dish um, for about two months, and they form these embryoid bodies. And gradually, um, they start... So, oh, sorry. They start to... If I get this... This is the embryoid body. You add a cocktail of growth factors, and this is the embryoid body here. And you start to see these little cells. They're just kind of shed off this embryoid body with this cocktail of growth factors. And then you collect these. So after about two months, you collect these cells. They're shed from what we call cystic embryoid bodies. And they look initially more like macrophages. Um, and then you mature them, and we've had to really work out what factors are, are the best ones to use to get these growth factor cocktail so that you get um, these microglia looking like this. So this is um, 
a microglial cell stained. I think we've got TREM2 and IBA1 on this microglial cell. And these are the two methods that we've used. So the garcia Wrightbot was the first paper we published, and that um, came out last year. And then we published a paper with Christian Haas because he wanted to look at our cells because all these animal models that are being used for Alzheimer's disease, knock-in, knock-out, humanoid, you know, whatever, they have weird, weird problems. And so we published this paper with Haas's group showing that actually the the um, mouse that he had had a splice variant, which you don't get either in human cells or in iPSC derived microglia. So now what we do is we, we have um, 16 different cell lines all going at the same time. I mean, it's a, basically a factory, and pretty much half our time now is looking after these cells. So it, and, that, and that's only supporting five people. So really, we need a factory that just churns these things out. And, and you know, it's incredibly expensive. We reckon it's costing us about 40 grand, 40 grand a year just to get this running, just to get the cells. But that's what we're doing. We're churning out these cells. And what we did was look at how they, um, we, we characterized them. So this is from that review I wrote. So basically, we looked at what gene transcription is. We looked at their functional capacity. We looked at whether they um, do what's classically known as tiling, or we call it contact inhibition in the dish, because initially they're all over each other like cancer cells. And gradually, as they mature, they spread out. So to start with, we did this gene array. Now, what we did was um, we got, um, it's not very easy to see, but this is our original iPSCs. These are various, this is the classic, medium that a lot of these um, labs doing these cells use, ex vivo. And this is a different medium we tried. And then this is, we call it TP1, which is Tom Pierce one, because he was the one that messed around and did all this. These are human microglia. These are our three different lines tested against human microglia. Um, this is another medium. These are, I, mean, I can't read my own. These are human macrophages. Uh, that's a cultured for two weeks, and, and you know we've just messed around with all these different medium and media until we got this, which we now use. So it's kind of nearer to the human microglia as we can get. Obviously, you know it's very difficult to get human microglia. We're in a big consortium at the moment in the, with the EU to look at TREM2, and it's been absolutely horrendous trying to get human, because we all want to compare between different sites what our iPSCs look like. But anyway, that's what ours look like. <clears throat> so um, we then went on to look at this characterization. So there's this idea of, I think it was Butovsky who said that there was gene signature for microglia. So we looked at them, and they expressed these particular gene signatures um, for so C1QA, TMEM119, TREM2, APOE, CSF1R, TyroBP, CG33, P2R, Y12, et cetera, et cetera. And these are MIB independents. That means they are uh, derived from the yolk sac rather than from, from um, the macrophage root from blood, uh, blood, blood type cells. So as a MIB independent, um, which means that they're from this microglial line. And then we started characterizing um, TREM2. I'll just talk a little bit about this. So basically, well, actually, I'll go on because I want to finish this bit first. So we then looked at the characterization, and you can see on the left panel here that um, they are what we call tiling. Initially, they're all over each other like this, but they're tiling. They start to put out these ramified processes, and they respond to ATP. It's interesting because I was talking earlier, um, it was Alice, and um, we don't get this initially. This comes after they've matured for a bit. So it's one way of checking that you've got mature um, microglia because they, they then respond with ATP. So they respond like this. This is our functional competence. So functional competence, can they release cytokines can they, to a stimulus? Can they phagocytose debris? So this is our phagocytosis of, in this case, avototic cells. And I'll talk a bit more about that because we use that as an assay for TREM2. 
And this was uh, a cytokine array. So you can get these really cute little cytokine arrays. I don't know if anyone here's used them, but they have about 109 cytokines, and you just dunk your medium on, um, and then you can see what's being released. So this was um, a control, what we call common variant line, stimulated with LPS. And you can see the classic TNF-alpha, IL-6, uh, and then a few other ones coming up. So they phagocytose. We've looked at phagocytosis of fluorescently labeled, DIL labeled A beta, um, a pyloprotein, a lipoprotein, sorry, um, E. coli, zymazan, dextrin, and they all can get taken up. So they're competent at taking up these different ligands. So we've now got all these different assays set up in the lab so that we can look at what's going on with various lines. So we can look, for example, at where the receptors are, where they're expressed in the cells. We can do migration assays, although I must admit these cells so far, they don't tend to move once they're on the... We use glass cover slips, which they absolutely love, and they don't tend to move about a bit, so I might have to ask people about what they use, but we've tried all sorts. But scratch assays are what we tend to use. And we do proteolomics, um, ELISA, path scan signaling. So we're pretty happy with what these cells are doing in terms of their function. So they're very reproducible. You can get large numbers. Um, you can do a lot of assays with them. So we think, you know, we're quite happy with them. So on to AD. So TREM2 is this uh, membrane receptor. It's a glycoprotein, and it's thought to bind various ligands, including uh, phosphatidylserine, phospholipids, um, apoptotic cells, apo, apo lipoprotein, and is expressed on macrophages, microglia, osteoclasts, and dendritic cells. But in the brain, it's only microglia. And in fact, if you get out peripheral macrophages, they have a very low expression compared with microglia. But there are different diseases associated with both microglia, osteoclasts, and macrophages, and I'll talk about that. So we've been looking at what happens with this, with the mutations for this receptor. So it links into the membrane with this um, Else, but not a huge amount on human. But this group here, Bailey et al., showed that you get lipid binding to TREM2. And in particular, you get phosphatidylserine, um, phosphatidic acid, and also uh, cardiolipin. But phosphatidylserine is the one that interested us, and I'll show you why. So this is the genetic variants, and there's a whole different range of variants. And what's interesting is these are linked to a number of diseases we're looking at. So W50C is linked to uh, like a frontal temporal dementia. R47H is the one that's linked to Alzheimer's disease. Um, T66M is linked to a horrible disease called Nasu Hakala, which gives you bone cysts and very early onset dementia. Um, and it, you know, we, we have one cell line from Home, and that's homozygous and the two parents, which are heterozygous. The two parents have no symptoms, but the homozygous daughter has the symptoms. R47H is a heterozygous mutation, so there's only one allele needed for that. 
and the same with W50C. So what's interesting, all of these um, mutations which are linked to AD are in this curl IgG type extracellular domain. And it's thought that somehow this influences how the cell, well, initially, how the cells actually traffic this. So these are all the lines that we've got in the lab. And you can get some of these now from a company called, um, well, it's a, it's a bank, really, EBISC. So um, we're involved with a couple of companies that are actually making these. And you can now get these common variant. And these are syngenetic lines. So they're all derived from the same base cell line. So C7, which is the one um, we're using at the moment, and these C17s, we've got all of these. We derive these from the stem cells, which were provided to us from Matt Blurt and Jones in California. And some of these, um, these were from John Hardy's group, the T66 Hemp and Hot, and this is from Henry Holden at the Institute. And various other ones, people are quite willing to give you their control lines. Um, so we've got quite a few, and we tend to grow all of them at the same time because we keep them going because they only last about two, two months and two weeks and then you have to start again. I mean, it's, it's incredibly tedious. If you... So we wanted to examine what's happening with this receptor. What is it doing to the cells? What are the ramifications of this, these mutations? And as I say, there are a number of different roles that could be involved, such as phagocytosis, um, moving, cytokine secretion, et cetera, et cetera. So we did this mostly with the T66M and the W50C. So we published this paper last year looking at this, and I'm now going to go and t show you what we found. So essentially, in the, these are uh, what we call homozygous variants. These are the heterozygous. So there's no real difference in the, uh, this is the mRNA, except for these homozygous clones. So they don't produce the mRNA, whereas their accessory protein is fine. What we also found was that this soluble TREM2 is not shed from these. So there is no soluble TREM2 being released by these cells. They absolutely don't shed it at all. And what we also found is that they don't mature. They don't have, the, they have an immature form and they don't get a mature form which is trafficked to the surface. And they have a lack of this, this is a C terminal fragment. So basically all they have is an immature TREM2. So basically there's a trafficking problem and there's a, um, a problem with the processing of this protein to the surface. And this is just analyzing this. So Interestingly, we're now looking at R47H, and this hasn't got a trafficking problem, even though it's a heterozygous mutation, which is very high risk of Alzheimer's. It does not have a trafficking problem. And this is what this um, TREM2 variants, where they're heterozygous and homozygous, look like. So this is a wild, what we call wild-type common variant, and this is the heterozygous. I mean, there is slightly less, but you know, some of these cells don't have it at all, but these two, that homozygous clone and this homozygous um, mutation have no visible TREM2 protein. So the TREM2 protein is completely lacking in these cells. So we then looked at what is going on with cytokines, because this is one of the things that everybody said, they aren't going to produce cytokines, they're going to be um, affected, they're just going to be sort of paralyzed. Well, surprisingly, when we stimulated this was with um, LPS, they still release uh, significant amounts of TNF-alpha, maybe a little bit less, but nothing really significant, and the same with IL-6. And when we did this sort of array again, there was no difference. There really is no difference, and this was the big cytokine array we did. There really is no difference in the cytokine secretion, so they're still able to produce cytokines. They're still quite happy they're producing cytokines. And they're not overly inflammatory. They don't produce over or above what normally is released. So they're not... Well, everybody thought that, you know, TREM2 might act as a lock. I thought it was. That, that if you remove that lock, they'd just be inflammatory, and that would process and, and produce all this inflammation in AD, but it's not the case. We then looked at phagocytosis. So in this particular case, we looked at phagocytosis of this rhodo E. coli and rhodozymazan. So E. coli 4... Um, uptake through the um, toll light receptor 4 and zymosin through uptake through toll light receptor 2. And the nice thing about this, if you haven't used it, 
It doesn't fluoresce until it's in the cell and then it fluoresces. So we looked at the uptake over two hours and some of these homozygous mutations, yeah, might be significant, um, but there really wasn't a huge difference. You know, they're still able to take up E. coli and they're still able to take up zymosome, maybe a little bit less with the E. coli. And it's interesting because the, the, the homozygous expressing patient that um, our group or John Hardy's group were trying to get more um, tissue from, I think she lives in Turkey. And every time we had, it was like an, a military operation. We had everybody ready to go so that when they went out there, got some, got some tissue, uh, skin punch, came back, we were all ready to go and process this. But this poor girl, she was only about 30, every time they went out, she had an infection. And we've noticed this with these cells. You sit, you look at them, and we were like, why are they always getting infections? You know, everything else doesn't. They just don't seem to be able to cope with infections very well. So it's interesting that even in vitro, there's a problem with these cells clearing um, little bugs that might be around. So if you, you know, normally microglia in culture, you, you'll get a little bug and they'll clear it and then it's fine, but these cells just can't do it. So there was definitely a, a mild effect on E. coli, but nothing on zymosome. But we were hunting around for a long time to try and find a ligand of these cells. And because of that lipid binding array I showed you with the phosphatidylserine, we realized that we can use apoptotic cells because apoptotic cells, or normal cells, they have phosphatidylserine inside the membrane and they only flip it in and out occasionally. If they're a little bit stressed, they can flip it out and then it goes back in. But apoptotic cells flip it all out to the surface. So we devised a boiling strategy for any old cell line. This was SHSY5Y, but you could use any cell line. And we checked that when you boil it, well, they didn't boil it, we put it at 42 degrees for two hours, and then you look at facts of an exin 5 FITSI. So an exin 5 will stain or bind to the external phosphatidylserine and fluoresce. So we did this by facts, and we found, yeah, you can use this as a, as a quite robust way of getting phosphatidylserine in quite a physiological, pathological model. So some people use cell fragments, but I think that's a bit dodgy because you're going to get all the stuff like um, DNA and RNA that can activate different receptors on microglia. But with these, they're apoptotic, so they're all sort of screwed up, but they still have an exin 5, and this was just a few cells we took from here and put them in a fluorescent microscope just to check that you've got an exin 5. So we now use this as a ligand to activate TREM2. So what we found with some of these lines is that, and here's the facts for this, but this is the summary, control cells will take up um, apoptotic cells and fluoresce in the facts. T66M HEP, yeah, there's no difference really, I mean minor difference, but the homozygous clones or, or the homozygous lines really have a reduced ability to sense apoptotic cells or this ligand and we checked the whole lot, was apoptosis of the cyto cytoclase in D. <coughs> so, sorry. So basically, we've now gone on to probe this in a little bit more detail. And when we tried to publish this, we had a few people saying, um, you need to go and check what your survival is like. Because in... Um, animal models of this, TREM2, they don't survive. And we actually found it was quite robust. You do have to take all the, cell, all the medium off for quite a few hours and leave them out for 72 hours, this, this, gra Oops, sorry. this graph here, before they'll die. So, yes, they are quite sensitive. And what's interesting about them, I, I don't think you can see there, but what's interesting is the, the shape. So if you just have a control, common variant, cell line, they're all, as I showed, they've got nice processes. With T66M homozygous and the um, W50C homozygous, they're quite round. And we also had some BV2 cells that we've CRISPR, correct, CRISPR knocked down TREM2, and they are really obviously round. They don't put out processes. They're all rounded up. They have very fine processes only. They don't have these ramifications. And we find that with these TREM2 homozygous variants, they really do not put out processes. And because of this survival problem, we looked at 
well, you know, it's not that really the phagocytosis, it's very subtle. The cytokines, again, very subtle. There's nothing hugely changed in these cells. Why is it a risk factor? And basically, if you think about it, people are surviving with late-onset Alzheimer's disease to their 70s. So it can't be something horrendously drastic because you wouldn't survive that long. So it's got to be something quite subtle. So we decided to look at the mitochondrial um, status of these cells. And we used two different assays. The one on the left is the mitochondrial respiration assay. Now, these assays are very nice because you just plate your cells on a 96-well plate, shove them in a seahorse, and analyse their mitochondrial respiration. So on the left one, you can see that you can look at um, various aspects. So you can look at here, basal respiration, ATP production, this is just your proton leak, maximal respiration, this spare capacity. And we also looked at the glycolytic function because microglia can switch. When they are activated, they can switch to glycolysis to um, provide themselves with enough energy for gene transcription, protein synthesis. So they can undergo this glycolytic switch. So we looked at glycolysis in these cells as well. And what we found was actually quite... Well, we didn't expect it, actually, but we found that there are quite a lot of differences. So this is the starting point of these cells, and these are all the different lines. So um, what we're introducing here is this R47H um, heterozygous line, which is all our patient lines from patients who've got Alzheimer's disease. And our control lines are what we call common variant. They're just normal people who haven't got any weird um, so far. AD genes. And then this is the homozygous um, line that we got from EBISC. This is our T66 Nasu Hakala heterozygous parent who hasn't got any disease. This is our homozygous um, daughter, and this is our homozygous um, frontal temporal dementia. But it is like an AD type um, dementia. And these are all the different uh, changes that you see when you add FCCP to collapse the, the mitochondrial membrane potential. And what we found was, and this part here is known as the respiratory capacity, and what we found is there's a gr almost a graded response with the expression of these different um, phenotypes or variants. So this is a control, this is the L47H, HET, homozygous, T60XM, homozygous, and W50C. So these cells don't have the ability, they have very spare, what we call... Um, well, I'll take you to the next one. They have a very um, reduced uh, mitochondrial respiration. This maximal respiration that they can undergo is much more reduced. So, in fact, they're not really inflammatory. They're not actually able to murder anything. They're literally just sitting there, not really doing anything, really unable to do as much as a normal microglial cell can do. So that would mean they can't move about very well. They haven't got the energy. They can't... Um, flicker sensor, they can't uh, respire very easily and they can't upregulate up their respiratory capacity. So what I said was that microglia, I mean, various groups have, have shown this. We've not really dabbled in it, but we thought we'd better look at it. So basically, when microglia are activated, you know, and most of the time they're in this uh, surveillance state, low activity, when they become activated, so, so for example, if they get exposed to anything, they can up their um, glycol they switch to glycolysis, and so they can produce more energy. And they can produce more energy by using uh, fatty acids and, and glucose. So we looked at this, um, and we looked at it with this ECAR, with this glycolysis uh, agent seahorse kit. So we looked at what's happening with these different parameters in the microglia, and shockingly, they can't undergo glycolysis either. So they can't undergo respiration. Their, their maximum respiration, they're just about surviving, basically. Um, their maximum respiration is reduced, and their glycolytic capacity is also reduced. So TREM2, surprisingly, doesn't do what we all thought it might do. So it doesn't allow these cells to respire normally. It doesn't allow them to switch to glycolysis or at least use glycolysis, and, and their glycolytic capacity is reduced. So what we're doing now is probing. Well, if you, for example, one way of making them switch to glycolysis is to 
expose them to TNF-alpha. And what we're doing now is trying to work out, well, do, can they still do this? One thing that we have found is that if we, act, we expose them to apoptotic cells, they can switch to glycolysis. And we think that is because they're using the lipids in the cells to produce energy. But they can't do it apart from that. There's a lot of downstream signaling processes which are disrupted, which I'm not sure I've got time to look into. So surprisingly, this is what TREM2 does to your microglia. It doesn't actually make them this inflammatory cell that we all thought was going to go on. It makes them less able to respond, in fact, to certainly to various signals. We've also found that they really are crap at taking up A-beta. So they cannot um, phagocytose A-beta. So conclusions to our murder mystery, we have these different clones. We have heterozygous and homozygous clones of TREM2. And we're looking at, at the expression and shedding. They all differentially produce uh, a different response. And funnily enough, R47H has no problem shedding TREM2. They produce it like crazy. It's still being shed. So there again, that is subtly different from what's going on with the T66M clone and the W50C. So each of these little um, GWAS SNPs are doing something slightly different to the protein molecule. And we think it's because of the binding and the, the charges. So R47H is going from an arginine to a histidine, and arginines are charged. And so they make a, a kind of charge patch on this um, molecule that's sitting out, or the, the structure that's sitting out of the cell. So without that patch of arginine, they can't do what they're supposed to be doing. When that is, they cannot, um, well, what we think is they cannot signal downstream. So we've got impaired, we've got some TNF-alpha secretion. It's slightly up, but I mean, it's not anything to write home about. We've got slight impaired phagocytosis of E. coli, but definitely phagocytosis is impaired of um, anything with a phosphatidylserine signature on it. And different, different uh, variants affect this metabolic respiration and glycolysis slightly differently. The changes are very subtle, as we'd expect, but what we're doing now is we're trying to work out, um, we're just about to start looking, which is quite exciting, about what happens when you co-culture these cells with neurons and astrocytes, and these are going to be um, iPSC-derived neurons. In particular, we want to look at some of the ones that are expressing various presenilin mutations to see how it works. So finally, all the people that worked on this, um, I'll show you the people in my lab at the moment. So Pablo Garcia Wrightbock came into my lab. He's a medic. He came into my lab and set up and will help set up the iPSCs. Claudio um, helped produce all the um, the CRISPR corrected BV2 cells. Thomas Pears um, set up and you know really worked out what we need to do to actually make these cells more like microglia. Anna Malak also did that with him. She's a PhD student. Kat Koska, the girl with two children, I was talking to you about, is a senior postdoc. She's also working on this now. Alex Phillips is a PhD student in my lab, and this is my tiny lab now up the Shard in London. So thank you very much. <clears throat> so who here is looking at IPSC cells? Anybody doing it? Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a... Uh, I, do, I do kind of regret it in a way, to be honest, because it's so intensive. Thanks, uh, nice uh, work, and thanks for sharing the data. Um, so I'm uh, interested in, since you mentioned uh, that the differentiation protocol is kind of expensive and tedious, there's a recent publication, uh, I think from last year, from Hendrik Alenius, from, he was a postdoc in uh, Verning Lab, I guess. So he produced induced microglias coming from uh, IPS cells yep. by transdifferentiation. Did you ever test and compare this uh, artificial microglia cells with your population you generate with? Uh, uh, no, it might be in the review we wrote, but no. We're, I think because it's taken us so long to do what we're doing and because we characterized it, unless somebody comes up with something, I mean, I could definitely look into it, but we quite like ourselves now. You know, we know what they do, we know what they look like, we know how they act. 
So unless I get a huge great grant to shift, I probably won't. Um, but at the moment, we're collaborating with various groups around Europe to, and various companies to test how they all vary. Various people have used different protocols, and we're going to do um, RNA-seq on them to check, just with the common variant, to check how similar we all are and whether different protocols really make that much difference. But, yeah, I mean, I'll look, it, I'll look into it definitely if it's quicker. But these take two months, but as I say, we've got a rolling system now where we kind of get them going at two months, and then once you get past the initial stage where we have to be in every day, they can sit for quite a long time, and you just have to change the medium every three or four days, and then you plate them all, and then we, we use them in two weeks. So it's just a question of getting people... You know, getting in this rotor. <clears throat> Jenny, from your old tradition about transmitter receptors, did you look for functional expression? I haven't looked at functional. I did, I did present at a meeting, actually, some stuff I did on uh, when I first got these cells, and I put it up and said, these are iPSCs, and they express m glue virals. So that's as far as I've got. So they, whether they're functional, I don't know. I mean, I'd like someone to do some <laughs> functional analysis on them because we have no idea what receptors they express. I mean, they definitely, ex they definitely express the uh, ATP, um, PY12 or whatever it is. So they definitely express that, and they definitely respond to AT but ATP. But we haven't looked any further at what ion channels are expressed, you know, whether they I, Yeah, I just don't know. Metabotrope glutamate receptors from your tradition. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, they definitely got M glues. So that was quite quite nice. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry this is probably a completely irrelevant question, but I, I was just wondering, I didn't quite understand how you make the link between the mutations in TREM two and the effect you see. Are they really due to the mutations in TREM2? Is, is there sort of a direct genetic analysis in, 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 in your data? Which yeah, they've all, yeah, I mean, everything has been, um, everything has been, I don't know, CV, C, CV, you know, we've checked everything, that the mutations are there, we've checked that the, uh, the genes are mutated, it's all been an, analyzed. In that paper, you can see, the, the Microbot paper, CM, CD, I can never remember the name. So they've all, they're all, they only express that mutation. There's no other mutations or um, SNP modulated um, modulators in these cells. Yeah, but they, are, they, are, they are completely different genetic background cells, no? Well, not well. We haven't. We have got this cell line. So we, yeah, I know that's why. If you, if I go back, I'm not sure if I can go back. Um, let me go down. Initially, yeah, what you have to do is make sure, so for example, let me see what we've got here. These are all the different lines. So this ADRC 8, 8.3, 8.12, 26.3, all of these are different patient lines. The Bione C, Bione C7 and the Bione C17 are syngeneic lines. So basically they have all the same genetic background. And then the controls, we've got three up here, but we've actually got four. And then what we have for each of these are nine clones. So we have to, yeah, literally, you have all these different lines and all the different clones, and then you have to check that everything is behaving exactly the same and that they've been CMV to check that they have this mutation and only that. So, yeah, I am pretty sure that that is what is going on here. We're all pretty sure. Initially, um, when the people started working on these iPSCs, um, people were publishing with a lie N of four, and we tried it, and then we had to go back and get this lot before they'd let us publish it. So, yeah, you do have to be careful. Um, and there are quite, there are little subtle differences. So there's obviously other stuff going on, but, you know, it's like saying every mouse is the same, and all of us here are the same, we're not. There's something else going on. But, in, in, but what we found is they all respond exactly the same in terms of the, of the assays that we're doing. Jennifer, I wonder if I could ask about the uh, causality question, but slightly differently. 
So the metabolic defect you described, is that unique to the microglia, or could that be also affecting the iPSCs and the hematopoietic progenitor cells, such as a shift in the differentiation potential and the ultimate outcome of the, what you call microglia yeah. if you have a TREM2 defect? Um, it's possible. I mean, that's a good point. And I think, yeah, we should probably check, but yeah. Because the way point. that we've gotten around it by studying a cancer-causing genetic change is to actually create a line where we can acutely inactivate our favorite gene and so that we can establish that it occurs at the level of the cell we're studying yeah. as opposed to the process yeah. of getting there. Well, that's, that's quite interesting because what we want, and it's definitely worth us looking at because we also want to grow, my, we also want to grow uh, iPSC neurons from these same lines to see, you know, then you won't have any, so for example, by only C's, by only C mic neurons, what's going on versus all these other things. So, yeah, it's a good point. We'd have to check to make sure that it's nothing to do with the, the initial process. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.